the argument about uh, a new capitalism, um, a change in the nature of work, transformation of society is predicated, predicated by this idea that there are new patterns of engagement between employers and workers, new patterns of engagement, that is relational change. People like Sigmund Beaumont talk about an individualization within the, work, uh, within the workforce. Workers don't in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, engage with the world collectively, but do so on an individual basis, because the bonds of reciprocity between workers and employers have been rendered tenuous by globalization. The, so the argument is a bit, uh, fundamental to this, and that's why you know, people like Castells talk about the end of salaried employment, the end of salaried employment, the end of wage labor. It is utter nonsense. There's no evidence for it, and that's why kind of, I, mean, I, I, I invest a lot in trying to kind of establish the, the, the truth of these matters because trends are going in the opposite way. There's some good news and bad news in all this with, I mean, with the crisis. I believe, for instance, that we were not, this is a crisis of similar proportions in terms of growth uh, and GDP to the 30s. I do not believe we're going to go back to the levels of unemployment we saw in Germany, in America, in Britain, and so forth, the 20 to 30 percent of, of, un, of unemployment. That's the good news. The bad news is something else. I believe that the ruling class has an agenda for fiscal consolidation and austerity, which is two decades long. Two decades long. We're talking about an OECD report last summer which says Greece is doing quite well with its fiscal consolidation. And if it keeps doing what it does, it'll get to 60% debt in 20 years' time. The fiscal pact for Italy says you can get down at 3% per year of your debt, of government debt, from 120% debt down to 60% down to debt. That's what they're demanding. That's two decades. We're not talking about something that is an overnight swallowing a bitter pill. We're talking about a period now, a phase, in which, you know, in which things are operating. Now, the idea of precariousness, and it's not a terminological uh, issue, or uh, uh, there are important issues at stake here. Precarité, as uh, Bourdieu said, it was a mode of social control. People were made to feel insecure. If they have job insecurity, it is not a natural function of living in this world of fast technology, of changing of, of movements, or, uh, of, of global capital. People are made to feel insecure. Not only that, the left and trade unionists internalize that. Workers themselves in canteens and in, in workplaces say, oh, there's no jobs for life anymore. That's the, the discourse, it's real. To argue that the precariat occupies a place, a unique place, with a distinct set of insecurities a distinct set of interests that sets them apart from the rest, I think is fundamentally mistaken and it goes against the of what's happening. Now, again, it's not, it's not terminological because when Guy says a third in the United States, a third of all employees, a third of all employees receive a significant share of income in shares. In other words, a third of employees in America are tied in immediately and directly to the profits of the companies that they work, they work for. And the precariat working around them have got different and antagonistic interests. So the, 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 the so-called workers who are hugely benefit, uh, benefiting from shares have a different set of interests from the precariat around them. Now, at risk of sounding like Victor Mildrew, I just don't believe it. <laughs> the idea that a third of the workforce in, in America receive big chunks of, them, of income through shares, I think, is, is yet to be substantiated. The idea of a distinct set of interests, a distinct set of insecurities. Johnny's point is really well made. The, the demands of young people, the youth with no future in Spain, what was it? Jobs, pensions, homes. These are the, kind of, these are the, these are the, uh, the issues and demands of the time. And that cuts with the grain of the working class movement, the broader working class. It's not separate from it. It's part and parcel of that. It's consistent with it. And so therefore, the idea of some rupture, some bifurcation in the working class, some polarization of the working class, is goes against the impact of the recession, which, as I say, demands and reinforces the need to establish the commonality of interest and the collective need to defend them. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I can't, I can't respond to all the points, uh, but let me just make a few remarks, and hopefully in a lighter vein than some of them that have come in my direction. Um, I find that, first of all, 
there is a restructuring and we have to recognize analytically and politically that this does create tension between different groups. If we pretend that what exists is what we would want to exist, we'll be burying our head in the sand. There are conflictual interests, whatever Kevin has just said about those statistics, I'll give him a <coughs> reference afterwards, but there are differences. That does not mean that we cannot overcome them in the class structure. So that, that, let's settle that once and for all. We can achieve it, but if you don't recognize that there are ruptures between different groups, I think you, you impoverish the analysis and you impoverish the political strategy of the struggle. Now, if you go to a meeting of people who stand up one after the other and say, I'm a member of the precariat, their agenda and their vision is often profoundly different from what if you go to a traditional working class meeting. Now, I may not object to that or I may not, but to pretend that we all have the same vision, the same interests and things, is just being dogmatic. Now, I think that's a first and fundamental thing. It may well turn out that the nature of our analysis is going to be different in a couple of years than what it is now. But don't think that we can just bury the, the debate. Now, you made the point about this temporary thing. I've answered it with Richard uh, Seymour, and I think it's complete bunk. But this is a typical one. It stems from an abstract refusal to understand the nature of the labor relations that are emerging. He said that they're only 6% temporary in Britain. All right? That is no, I the... Didn't say that, actually. You did. I, I wrote it down. I wrote it down. Um, you said that, that. No, that wasn't. The, the statistic I gave was that the number of people who are on... Temporary, temporary contract, 6%. No, it's all right. Carry on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, what so, yeah. what did you oh, say then? What I said was that the, the number of people who are on temporary contracts who would like to become permanent or in part-time jobs... It was 1.9 million, time, that's what you said. 1.9 million. Yeah. After you'd said the 6%. No, 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 no Anybody who had a contract that had lasted less than 12 months were de facto temporary. They had no employment rights. And then Osborne, that wonderful man, last October in his speech to the Conservative Party conference, suddenly abolished employment rights, or whatever you want to call them, for all those employed for less than two years. So in fact, de facto, he converted millions into what other countries would be called temporary statuses. I mean, to, to, to try and put too much focus on a stylized interpretation when in fact labor law has been such that it is changed. So we actually have millions of people <coughs> who are de facto in short-term casual temporary statuses. And to pretend otherwise, because you haven't delved into the figures, is, is I think, not helpful for our struggle. And, that, and I think that is, is, is particularly the, the case with, with something like this employment tenure. The fact is that in the last 20 years, the mean average employment tenure of men in this country has gone down by two years. All right? That's a two-year drop in the mean average. And that is a time of aging. So that the aging means that a larger proportion are actually expected to be long-term uh, employees. So that's a huge change in a very short period. We can see many forms of insecurity, and to pretend that it's not creating tensions between different groups, I think is, is, is not helping us in, in forging a political strategy. Now, there, there are many other points, and I apologize for not, not responding to them. The person who said that we must not focus on the post-1945, I, I agreed with that point. I forget who it was. I apologize for that. And that is precisely why I tried to depict it as from 1919 uh, onwards. But I don't think that the precariousness of the early 20th century is anything like the same as we're getting at this moment. 
And it's a different character. And what I try and do in the books is I look at seven forms of labor-related insecurity that have grown. And that pattern of seven forms includes a chronic increase in income insecurity by the various restructuring of incomes. We haven't had enough time to discuss that, but for me that is part of the most important part of, of, of the story. Now, thank you for your comments, even if there's a lot of skepticism, but I, I hope some of you will engage with, with the subject and, and continue to do so. Thank you very much. I think our position should be that we're not saying that nothing has changed and we're not saying that there is nothing ever new in the way in which work is structured. I think the point that we should be making though is that we have no interest in exaggerating the shape, the form or the extent of the ways they're doing. Because you see, the ruling class do have an interest in exaggerating the insecurity of our, te of our job tenure, the temporariness of our contracts the footloose nature of globalisation. You can see the interest that they have in doing that. I don't see the interest that our side have in doing that. Having said that, there are changes. Globalisation is a real phenomenon. It is true that capitalism is a more global system today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. That doesn't mean that capital has become all-powerful. And that doesn't mean also that the state is no longer relevant. In fact, some ways, I think the globalisation creates for us a very positive phenomenon, doesn't it? It creates a global working class. It means that the working class is now located everywhere in the world and is now genuinely a majority of the world population. That There is now nowhere in the world in which workers do not exist and are not part of the global working class. It's also not, we're not saying that nothing has changed in the nature of work. We have faced enormous attacks at work over the past few decades. We talked in the last session about how profit, profit levels have been maintained by an increase in exploitation of working class people. The longer hours that people work, the unpaid overtime that is increasing that people do, and also the restructuring of work, particularly in the public sector, that means people are increasingly working on basically on a production line method of work the increasing target driven the you know people will talk about whether they're in academia in teaching in health work all the rest of it your person that you're supposed to be providing a service for is a client or a customer and you have to have an outcome that's measurable at the other end and all the rest of this sort of thing that has made is an attempt to make people work harder for less and for longer so restructuring has occurred in those terms. That, however, does not mean that we have a new fragmented class system. If anything, the changes that I've talked about, the globalisation and the way in which work has been restructured in major parts of the economy, have made a class that is easier to unite and not harder to unite. Now, of course, it's true that some people work in more precarious jobs than others. And this, um, this comrade at the front says, how can Mr. Reasonable, has says, how could anyone possibly disagree with the idea that there is a precariat? Now, of course, there are more precarious jobs. There are areas that it's a horrendous, more horrendous place to work than others. There are places where you're more likely to get the sack more easily, where you're likely to be monitored more consistently, where you're going to be on a shorter term contract and you're going to be bullied more easily. There are worse places to work and more precarious places to work than other places that have defended their position. And it's true that there have been a whole number of campaigns across Europe and elsewhere to try and drive back the attempts to make our lives more and more insecure. The labour laws that make it easier to sack people has been an explosive point in France, for example. There have been lots of campaigns and we should support those campaigns and we should support union drives in places where people are not unionised. But to slide from saying we want to stop the encroachment of more insecure ways of working into the rest of the workforce, to slide from that into saying we accept that there is a separate group of people known as the precariat is a very dangerous route to take and a completely unnecessary route to take when we're talking about a situation in which the global working class is bigger than it was in Marx's day and shares more and more the same characteristics of the of, of the way in which work is organised as a whole. And I think you can see by any of the struggles that people talk about, and this is the same in Britain as the argument that we've had about informal workers in the global south, 
that where workers move as a whole, they can pull many other groups behind them, whether it's the students, the unemployed, the informal workers, the people on temporary contracts. And that doesn't take away from the idea that there is a strategic point to saying that organised workers are at the heart of a strategy for change. You see, I think there are two mistakes that the labour movement can make in terms of people in precariat work. The first one is that they can say that these people are unorganisable. And there are sections of the trade union leadership who have previously said that people who are in low pay, part-time contracts, who are, so who are under agency work, cannot be organised. The flip side of that mistake is to say that these are the only people worth organising. And that's to write off the big bulk of the working class who are organised. And I think we have to say we are working class because we have a collective social relationship with the way in which profit is extracted from us. And whether you do that through a temporary contract or a permanent contract, whether you do that through, through part-time work or full-time work, your relationship is the same and you are part of the working class, which means you have a shared interest in overthrowing and destroying a system that wants to bring us down. Now, insecurity is a real question in this because insecurity is one of the things that makes people frightened to resist. And I remember reading one of the key moments from the Arab revolutions, and somebody who was there explained it as being the moment that fear changed sides. And I think that's really what we're talking about here. The ruling class want to divide us all against each other. They want to divide the private sector against the public sector. There are sections on the left who would then replicate this by trying to pit supposedly privileged workers against unprivileged workers. We have to fight for the unity of the class as a whole. And we have to fight for the moment when the fear changes side. And that's why the big bulk of organised workers are so key to giving the confidence that the fear can change side from our side to the ruling class. <coughs>